A common sight along the roads and lanes during the 50s was the slow-moving convoy of a thresher and baler. Michael decides to thresh his corn just before Christmas. Sometimes, however, just getting into the field and up beside the stack proved to be a problem, and manpower again had to give that extra bit of assistance which was needed on this wet ground. days gone by, the corn would have been separated from the sheaves by means of a flail. This operation would have taken place in an open shed where a natural or man-made wind would have blown the shaft away and the cleaned corn could have been gathered up. Flailing was back-breaking work, as these men show. The flail was no more than a stick three or four feet long and another circular piece of wood joined to it by a leather thong. In the early part of the 20th century, steam thrashers were beginning to appear. This shot of a steam engine thrashing corn was taken outside Garva and attracted a large audience. The steam engine was heavy and could only be taken into a field which was hard and dry. This particular model would have used about half a tonne of coal during a day's work. Back at Mahara, the wheels of the thrasher are lowered into a hole dug for the purpose. This helped to steady the mill, which vibrated greatly and also acted as a brake. The belt has been hooked onto the pulley of the Fordson and to the drive pulley of the Thrasher. The second Fordson is driving the baler. One tractor could have driven both the Thrasher and the baler. Corn is forked onto the platform, the twine which has held the sheaf together since binding is cut and the corn is fed into the thrasher ears first. It now passes between the roller drums, knocking out the grain before the sheaf has cleared the rollers. The cleaned corn pickles pass into bags. Michael smells the newly thrashed corn. All seems to be okay. The chaff falls to the bottom of the thrasher and will be burned later. The straw coming out of the top of the thrasher falls onto a spiked conveyor belt on the baler. The big arm pushes it down where it is compressed into bales. These bales were much bigger and heavier than the modern pickup baler would produce. Thrashing a stack this size would have taken about two hours. As soon as the whins at the base of the stack began to die, the rats and mice would move in. 
Mr and Mrs Rat could have had a very comfortable winter surrounded by all the food and shelter they needed. However, when thrashing time came around, it was time for retribution. Any which might escape would certainly make their way eventually to the farmhouse. A welcome break for the workers was the tea being brought out to the field. The bales served not only as seats, but tables as well. Sometimes Tommy the Hardman, such a thing as Stuart, called Reglia Baldi. No. Yeah. You stuck yeah. a wee notice up on the side of her and away you went. <laughs> Denying all. No responsibility. You wouldn't get away with that nowadays? No, I don't know. The later models of them come out with, with screens on. The belts mm. was all screened down. No, no. If you look at most of the thrashing men around their country, they're all nine and a half fingers. Mm -hmm. They have the full complement of ten anyway. When the corn stack had been thrashed, the only job left was to burn the chaff. This fire would have burned for perhaps a week. For the older generation, this film should rekindle fond memories. For those less fortunate not to have experienced those wonderful times, it has given the opportunity to experience the farming methods of their forefathers. That age has gone forever, but reminders are still all around us in museums and in exhibitions devoted to recapturing the countryside as it was. To dedicated people like Tommy, Michael and Willie, we owe a debt of gratitude. <laughs>